Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Popular unity in Greece was only founded on August 21st of 2015. Just one month before the second snap election for 2015 took place on September 20th. The election was triggered when Alexis Tsipras, the current prime minister of Greece, had to resign on August 20th after serving just seven months as prime minister following two major votes on the bailout agreement implied a de facto non-confidence in the Cyprus-led government. What resulted was heated party meetings between those who supported the Alexa Cyprus uh, accepting the bailout package and those who wanted to exit the euro, default on the debt and go back to using the drachma and form a new economy in Greece. This forced a split in the Syriza party. The left platform camp went into the Popular Unity Party, headed by former energy minister Lafazanis. In the election, the Popular Unity Party received only 2.86% of the popular vote, just short of the required 3% to be permitted entry into parliament. This, unfortunately, has left much of the progressive left former MPs out of parliamentary debate. Now joining me to discuss the future of popular unity is Statis Kouvalakis. He's a member of popular unity. Prior to that, he served on the Central Committee of Syriza, and he was a member of the left platform of Syriza until the party then split in August. He's the author of many books and a reader in political theory at King's College London. Stathis, good to have you with us. Thank you, Shamini. Stathis, we were there during the July 5th referendum. We witnessed the political bind that the left platform was in when Syriza capitulated to the demands of the creditors, disregarding the results of the referendum. The split and the formation of uh, popular unity became necessary. But running in a snap election with a month's notice was a tall order. How are those who followed your lead uh, into the popular unity feeling about what happened and what is the mood in Greece at the moment? Right. Uh, the first thing that needs to be said, I think, is that uh, the dominant mood in Greece is a mood of disappointment and demoralization. And I think that this is quite easily understandable when, you know, the general of an army capitulates, uh, it's uh, a bit difficult to expect from uh, the soldiers uh, not to be affected by uh, this capitulation. So uh, in that context of demoralization and of defeat, uh, there were two reactions to that that prevailed. The first is the logic of the lesser evil. And this is why a majority of those who had voted for Syriza, the coalition of the radical left in January, uh, voted again for that same party in the September elections. Uh, they thought they have the illusion that uh, Syriza could still somehow soften up some of the austerity which is included in the new package. Now, another very substantial part of the electorate is just completely alienated by politics, deeply disappointed and angry, and those people abstained. And this is why those elections uh, registered the lowest turnout ever in Greek political history, with official abstention rates um, reaching 44%. So this is also an indication that uh, those who had put you know, their hope and their aspirations uh, for another course in Syriza now feel deeply demoralized, deeply disaffected, and uh, in uh, some cases we might say that you know, the lowering of expectations has been absolutely dramatic. So it was very difficult for us to wage you know, a battle in those circumstances. We had very little time. Uh, this whole move of calling for early elections in mid 
August, you know, for God's sake, in Greece in mid-August, calling for early elections. And essentially, this move was uh, meant to prevent us from uh, uh, running in the elections, or at least for giving us as little time as possible to organize. And so we had to face an enormous difficulty. We had to start everything and in less than a month uh, go to the elections. And uh, it also took by surprise the electorate, because the other aim of, the, of that move was uh, for people to vote before the concrete impact of those draconian austerity measures uh, could be felt in broader society. So now popular unity should have garnered more votes because it honored the July 5th referendum, where 62 percent of the people voted no to accepting the third bailout package offered to Greece, of course, by the Eurozone. So then what happened? Why did the OHI vote, or those who voted no in the referendum, not follow suit and vote for popular unity? Mm. Uh, I think, indeed, that what lacked in the campaign, partly due to uh, the objective lack of time, partly also because we were not sufficiently prepared for that, uh, was a more elaborate programmatic statement explaining why uh, the option of maintaining the anti-austerity direction and uh, going for uh, a confrontation with uh, the European Union and the European institutions, which means leaving the euro, because what we have seen actually all these months is that uh, if we stay in the euro, then inevitably we will have uh, to swallow memorandums and even more of austerity and uh, those memoranda. So we needed to explain how this is a viable and sustainable option for the country and why this is beneficial for uh, the working people. Um, but what I want to also add is that the dominant narrative in Greece uh, the narrative of, the, of Tsipras, of the government, and, of course, of all the media and the system uh, supporting uh, this policy, is that, is the, you know, the well-known TINA. There is no alternative. Uh, they, they don't say, you know, we are happy about the new memorandum or that, you know, it is intrinsically good, although they start saying a bit of that uh, now because they are quickly uh, adapting to, to this new course and... Uh, integrating that in, in, in their identity and their profile. But however, the dominant justification remains, we had no other option. Well, we think exactly the contrary, but we clearly need uh, to develop in a more systematic way uh, the reasons we uh, believe so. And uh, what is, I think, essential here is that um, we see that opportunity, we see that, that possibility as an opportunity to bring the deep social change Greece needs. Uh, and uh, this is how we see things. Uh, you have mentioned before that our project is to develop the national economy. Well, of course it is to reconstruct a destroyed economy, to reconstruct a, diso uh, a destroyed social fabric. Uh, and uh, to reconstruct a proper state, a proper set of public institutions which also have been dismantled these last five years of uh, the Troika rule and of the memoranda. But uh, our, our goal is uh, to uh, bring uh, a shift in the balance of social forces in, in Greece and to bring exactly all those changes that are necessary for the social majority for the working people, actually, to improve uh, their life and uh, to uh, change also their, their position within, uh, within society. So this is what our aim is for. Um, we want, uh, actually, to put forward uh, a transitional program that will lead to deep social change. Start this as a result of the election and as a result of the split in Syriza. Now, uh, what has come about is a situation in parliament 
where the left uh, resistance and the former left platform resistance in the party is vacant. And what will this mean for Greece? Well, of course, it's a very negative outcome, which is due to the fact that we haven't reached by a very narrow margin the 3% threshold that would have allowed us to enter uh, Parliament. And the only left-wing force in Parliament now is the Communist Party. But the Communist Party has proved uh, during all those years that it is actually, despite its very ultra-leftist rhetoric, that it's actually a toothless uh, opposition that is completely powerless, actually, and anodyne for, uh, for the system. Uh, and the other anti-memorandum uh, force, the other force supposedly opposing austerity, is the far right, uh, the neo-Nazi Golden Dawn Party. And this is, of course, extremely dangerous and uh, very, very concerning. Um, now, uh, the, the, the point is that it was absolutely impossible for us to stay inside Syriza once this memorandum was signed and once Tsipras had capitulated. There was absolutely no possibility for us uh, to stay inside the party. And uh, what, what I have to also um, make clear is that the membership had started leaving by thousands before us formally leaving uh, Syriza at, at the top level, if, if you like. So in any case, the split of Syriza started the moment uh, Tsipras decided to surrender and uh, to sign up the new, the new memorandum. So our choices were very limited, and uh, the time we were given was even more limited, uh, in a way. So we had to move uh, very quickly in a very difficult uh, situation and, and obviously in a very hostile environment. This explains partly, not entirely, but to a very large extent, uh, this uh, negative uh, result and outcome for the moment. But this is just, you know, the beginning. This is just the first, the first face of uh, what is to come now. Stratis, let's take up uh, continuing this discussion about what's going to happen to popular unity uh, in the future in our next segment.